Now, your last point was a very significant one, by the way, uh, about democracy and human rights. And you said that uh, when Asians begin to uh, do equally well in the field of democracy and human rights, then I think the West will be ready to have a more uh, meaningful partnership. And I think this reflects in many ways uh, a kind of very strongly held uh, psychological assumption that in many ways the West remains the gold standard when it comes to re democracy and human rights. And if the rest of the world can come up to this gold standard, then the world would be a better place. And it's true. I mean, it's absolutely true. The best democracies in the world are in the West. It's not a secret. Everyone knows it. Uh, but when you come to discussing the question of human rights, there has been a sea change in the world that is amazing how few people in the West have noticed. You know? There was a time when you could lecture the rest of the world on human rights and everybody would listen to you. But everything changed after Guantanamo. And it's amazing that the head of Amnesty International can actually say that Guantanamo is the gulag of our times. And why is that significant? You know, there were two, I would say there were two great leaps in the history of human rights. Two great leaps forward. One was when you abolished slavery. And today we wouldn't even dream of going back to slavery. It's inconceivable. We've completely left behind that era. And the other great leap forward was when we began to abolish torture. And we said, we want to create a world where no, no more torture will be practiced. And if you had asked me 10 years ago when I was coming here for breakfast, 1998, would the country that reintroduces torture be the world's, greater defend, be the world's greatest defender of human rights in the United States, I would have said, no way. But it happened. And you, you have no idea the shock it created on the rest of the world. And they said, hey, this country, the great beacon of democracy and human rights, it is now practicing torture. And what's even more stunning is to discover the number of European countries who quietly and secretly participated in the program by allowing their firstly cease abuse. And this is exposed by the Swiss prosecutor already. Now, what does that create in the, what, can you, the rest of the world, believe me, is extremely intelligent. And they can spot a double standard a thousand miles away. And they see this double standard, and then they get these lectures on human rights. And it's, you know, it's like the old fable, you know, of the emperor with no clothes, right? Here you are all saying, isn't the emperor wonderful, this gold standard of human rights? And the rest of the world sees the torture and says, what are you talking about? How can you possibly pass judgment on other countries? The State Department reports that they issue every year on human rights on other countries should begin with the phrase, very honestly, we in the United States have decided to reintroduce torture. This is our policy on human rights. Now, let me tell you what is wrong with your policy. And everybody will say, fine. Everybody's being honest. But if you give up that gold standard, then believe me, don't try and impose it on the rest of the world. And so we need a completely new dialogue on human rights. Uh, Warren Ho, New York Times. Uh, uh, Kishore, at the United Nations, continuing your conversation about human rights, there's an awful lot of talk about human rights and vertical action. Um, your region came in to focus on this issue last fall when the uh, regime in Myanmar uh, basically committed atrocities against its own people. Uh, I remember it well because ASEAN at that moment uh, actually spoke up in a way, frankly, that other regional groups don't usually speak up in such cases. And I remember uh, Singapore was the chairman at that point. And I think it was your foreign minister who said, uh, mm. what's going on in Myanmar re reflects badly on all of us. Mm. Uh, my question is, uh, accepting your, your verdict that, that the West has been very incompetent in this area as well as others, mm. uh, can we expect a more competent uh, performance by Asian nations in the defense of the human rights of its mm. citizens? 
The, the answer is uh, yes and a no. It's both. And the reason why I say yes and a no is that, and this is a point I made many years ago in my first book, Can Asians Think? You know, none of us, believe me, want to live in a society where we face the prospects of having our nails pulled out, of arbitrary detentions, of disappearing at night. Believe me, I don't want to live in that kind of society. And most Asians are the same as most Westerners. They, want, they crave for exactly the same kind of high standards of human rights that you have still domestically in most Western societies. So in that sense, the answer is yes. That's the direction in which we're going to go to. But the other big lesson that Asians have learned is that you cannot transform societies overnight. And here, frankly, you know, China, having watched what happened to Russia at the end of the Cold War, when they saw how Russia went to instant democracy, had an economic implosion, uh, life expectancy went down, infant mortality rates went up, there was a huge social problems in Russia. They said, that's not what we want for China. China has gone through 150 years of chaos to achieve where it is today, and therefore it will transform itself slowly in the issue of democracy. So, so the answer is yes, but not right away. But in the field of human rights, it will definitely move in a positive direction. And you yourself indicated this. The fact that you know, the ASEAN countries can come out and criticize the human rights standards of Myanmar or Burma is a, is a leap forward. Uh, in, it wouldn't have happened uh, before. But on the specific case of Myanmar, I actually had breakfast, I think just about 10 days ago in Singapore, or 12 days ago, with uh, the, the grandson of the Secretary General of the UN, Utan, you know, Tan Min Wu, who was a former UN official. And he said the great tragedy of this Western policy of sanctions on Burma and isolating Burma is that you have removed for 20 years all traces of Western influence in Burma. Why? Wouldn't it have been better to engage Burmese society? And this is where the West has got to get rid of this notion that the answer to everything is to impose sanctions. Because sanction, all that sanctions do is that they make you feel good. Ah, I've taken a moral stand. I've imposed sanctions. But they do no good. They don't transform the society. And the record shows that it's the societies that you engage that transform themselves. Class A example, China today. China's engagement with the world has, been, has transformed Chinese society completely. It's now a remarkably open society compared to where it was 30 years ago. And the societies that you ostracize, whether it's North Korea or Cuba or Myanmar, these societies don't improve. So my answer to you is for all these kinds of examples you cite, don't be afraid. You've got to learn to live in a morally complex world. There's nothing wrong in establishing diplomatic relations with a regime that you don't like, by the way. And incidentally, diplomacy was invented 2,500 years ago, not to enable you to talk to your friends. You don't need diplomatic immunity to talk to your friends. You need diplomatic immunity to talk to your adversaries. And this was figured out by our ancestors 2,500 years ago. But United States, the richest and the most powerful society, has somehow or other got this strange idea in his head that if he establishes diplomatic relations with the country, it's an act of approval. That was not why diplomacy invented 2,500 years ago. So my answer to you is send an ambassador to Myanmar today.